Okay, I think we're gonna go ahead and get kick things off here. Um, I wanna make sure everyone has changed their chat panel from panelists to all panelists and attendees. Um, we're gonna be using the chat a lot throughout the next 30 minutes. So um, please make sure you have changed that setting. Welcome to the first of four webinars in a series called the Four, Pillar, four Pillars to Transformative E-Learning e with Ethan Edwards, who's our Chief Instructional Strategist and Allen Academy Dean. Um, so this first pillar today will be on context. Um, just a quick bit about Allen Interactions. If you haven't heard of us or don't know our background, we've been around since 1993 and our mission is to enhance the human minded <clears throat> spirit through meaningful, <clears throat> memorable and motivational learning and performance experiences. Um, we have a variety of services we offer. So if there's any way that we can help any of you to build meaningful, memorable, and motivational learning and technology solutions. We are here to help in many different ways. Reach out to us and we'd love to talk. They're all listed here. You can learn more about them on our website. And now we're to Ethan. Um, I do wanna make sure that everyone knows that today's session is being recorded. So you will get a copy of the recording following it. Um, we will do these every Wednesday for the next four weeks from 12 to 12.30 Central, and they are 30 minutes long. Um, and we do encourage you to ask questions throughout the 30 minutes. I will be monitoring the chat and um, throwing those questions um, up to Ethan to address. Um, insights, comments, anything. Um, if you have any technical issues, you can switch that to just and send those just to the panelists and not to everyone. Um, but we look forward to this 30 minutes and I am going to um, turn things over to Ethan. And I did want to just recognize too on the back channel, we have Rich Peterson and Claire Lesney. So they're on the back channel too helping um, provide support. So always wonderful to have all of us together working together to make these things happen. So I'm going to pass things over to Ethan. Well, thank you very much, Carrie. I had a little pause there trying to load PowerPoint. But it's just a delight to be here to talk with you today um, on the first of these four webinars that we are going to explore a really powerful model that we have developed here at Allen Interactions. And honestly, I just think it's the answer to <laughs> what we need to do to create e-learning that works. And today we're going to talk about context. Um, I'll, I'll introduce all four in just a moment. But anyway, welcome. Um, we'll spend a a zippy 30 minutes here to try to, to give you some insights and some advice that maybe will help you in figuring out how you want to design the very best e-learning that you can do. Um, so um, what are we going to do today? I want to first um, share with you, you know, what is a challenge of designing for e-learning that we really face? Um, explore this idea of instructional interactivity really quickly, and then in particular, investigate five strategies that I think about when I think about what can context do to really make e-learning shine. And then we'll take a look at a couple of examples. So a lot to do in 30 minutes, but I think we'll, um, you'll leave with something that I think you'll feel good about. So what are the unique e-learning design challenges? Uh, you know, a lot of instructional design paradigms are, are fine, they're great, but they really focus on the content and often don't really, um, address what is really unique about creating um, e-learning. Um, one of them is, is a realization that presentation isn't teaching. And a lot of what, my shoulder keeps disappearing, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> one of the presentation is that um, we tend to tell things. And I think that is a, a, a pattern that is inbred in us through a lot of instructional design training, when in truth, we know that presentation isn't teaching. You know, just telling stuff isn't enough. And, and what, what is more, um, we need to engage the learner in figuring out how to do that learning. And, and really our focus should be more on learning actually than on teaching. Um, and to that end, the focus has to be on the learner. What is the learner doing? What, how are they actively engaged in, um, 
in a process that is going to help them create meaning. You can't do it for them. And I find that so often a lot of the hard work is done by the designers that um, instead of letting the learners do that work to get meeting, um, it's pre-processed in a way of thinking all you have to do is, is sit here passively and read it and you're going to learn. And that doesn't, that doesn't work. And then finally, you know, motivation is essential. It's when you're talking about asynchronous, individualized e-learning, there isn't a teacher there to tell jokes or to incite you through social um, pressure and, and, and those kind of challenges. And the learner is the only person there who is um, leading activities. And so part of the challenge of creating e-learning is how do you create motivation? How do you create a situation where a vast array of learners are going to be motivated to do the hard work that it takes to engage and, um, and learn new skills and ultimately change their performance? So um, those are really severe challenges that I think we need to focus on. And yet when we think about um, sort of typical plans, oftentimes they look like this. You, know, you have a checklist of things that have to happen. You, know, you, you gather the content from the, SEM, the SMEs. Then you sort of rewrite that into you know, the screens and, and in a way that's gonna, you think it's gonna be clear. And then you punctuate that with comprehension questions. After you tell somebody something, ask a question to see, do you get it? Um, then you sort of format it, you add media, um, and then you connect your LMS and you're done. That's sort of um, in a way that I think our industry and a lot of people are brought into this field think that's what the job is. Well, let's take a look for a minute and see how that works out. Um, probably too early, I'm gonna have to um, switch my sharing here in a minute. They're probably a little too early for questions, but Carrie, is there anything in chat? Let me know. Um, no, uh, there's, there's, nothing, um, there's nothing yet, Ethan, but I think maybe after you show this yeah. next piece, maybe uh, there will be. Yeah, so here, what I have is an example of some training. And maybe if you've seen me speak before, you might have seen this example. And it's, it's so, so good that we keep using it because it illustrates it. This is a piece of training that was written by a, a, a consulting company. And it follows a lot of the rules that I was just suggesting. And I think in many ways you can't fault it because it does all those things. It has a little introduction with the objectives. It's followed with a pretest. I'll, um, and the pretest is really, you know, do you know facts? Um, I'm going to skip through that for the, in the interest of time. And then it gets into the actual content. And it's telling me, you know, this, this was intended for bank tellers and they need to know about these different negotiable instruments. And so it shows them and it tells me that, um, and I can, I can click to reveal information about each of these items. Um, later on, I can, I can move around and explore parts of a check if I want. Um, it's all very well organized and very clear. The content is absolutely accurate. Um, and then, as I said, it's punctuated with some comprehension questions. Some are true and false. This one's a little bit more complicated in that I have to match definitions with um, terms. And so as I try to um, answer this um, and submit it, I get some feedback. So at any rate, um, you get the idea. <laughs> and I ask the question, well, I hope you realize that that's not very good training. And while it, but it follows all of our um, checklist items that so often people come to the situation with. And so we need to ask a question, what went wrong? Because um, you can't fault these, um, these things that we're showing on our clipboard. But the problem is it's not sufficient. Um, and what we have really spent our time at Allen Interactions exploring is that the, the problem is what is a learner being asked to do? And the interactivity in that example is pretty useless. And instead we propose that interactivity, instructional interactivity should sort of follow this model that's on the screen. Um, it, what this says is you need to provide a meaningful context um, for whatever you ask the learner to do. They need to be challenged in a way that is urgent, that captures your attention, not just hurdles to pass. Um, you know, there wasn't anything very pressing about answering that matching question. Um, and so there, it's pretty weak on challenge. 
The activity is what physical response you're doing. And again, you want those responses to seem real so that that's gonna increase the likelihood of transferring the learning to the real performance environment. And then feedback should actually be teaching that it, it should show consequences. And what we're here to talk about today in particular is context. And I wanna show you now what flipping that topic that I just looked at becomes when you focus on providing a meaningful context. Um, this is a rework of that same thing. And the bulk of this lesson is here. Um, actually, there was just a tiny bit of introduction to what are the six requirements and then you're in practice. And, and here I am looking at a check. I have to decide, is this negotiable? And it happens to miss the printed bank. And so this is not negotiable. And then I have to say, you know, right here, there should be a bank <laughs> printed. And that's why I'm saying this is not negotiable. Now, this is really just a multiple choice question. It's actually a, a true and false question, yes or no, followed by a multiple choice question, which piece is missing? And so there's one, one of the choices is there and the other choices are here. But this feels like something entirely different. It feels like I am doing banking. And partly it's because of the challenge and the way the question is, but primarily it is because of this is in context. The example we looked at a moment ago, that content could have been any topic in the world and you wouldn't have had to change a lick of that training. The problem with that is that we assume that the learners know how things relate to the rest of the world. Well, in truth, they very often do not. That's why they're in training. And so you could go through that first lesson and not ever really know when does this come into play? Whereas in this example, the context says, when you are standing at your teller station, you will be examining checks and this applies to that situation. You know, no words were needed to be said, but the context created that um, urgency of meaning. Okay, so that's what we mean by context. The, the, the contrast between this, um, you know, the, this is like an academic context. It doesn't really do anything except provide information and provide questions, as opposed to an immersive context that says, here's, what this here's why this matters. This is how you're going to encounter it and so forth. So that's what we're, that's what we're here to talk about. I'm gonna now go back and um, share some details about how we go about coming up with a good context. And while I'm switching there, um, Carrie, if you have, if, if there's any questions you want to um, I have a question. Yeah, I have a question for yeah. you, Ethan. Um, so these two different versions that you just, these two different treatments that you just showed, um, what's the impact with, on the subject matter experts and all of the content that is always so much often the focus? Well, um, it actually is a, is a shift of focus. And no longer is it so much on getting the words right as really working with the SME to find out, well, what are the challenges that get in the way of learners uh, connecting with this content? And then really figure out, like in that case, we work with the SMEs quite a bit to come up with all the right examples of, um, uh, of the kind of problems that a teller encounters when they're trying to deal with, um, with, with that. And so I think that there's a need for them to be, it needs to be more involved throughout the development process. But I think overall, um, the demands on their time is not really any greater. And I think, it, I think people find it rewarding because their real expertise is being drawn upon rather than just sort of the static knowledge that they develop. So and there you are. Yeah, yeah. So here we are. Um, and as I said, we have this model of instructional interactivity that we um, that I have to confess when we first started doing this, and it's, we've Michael Allen published this quite a number of years ago. Um, and at the time, I thought, now is that really sufficient to explain this? And I have to say that my skepticism was not well founded because this is just amazingly powerful. And I have to say that I, I use it every single time that I set out to design interactivity. But as today we're gonna to talk um, about uh, 
just the context of um, of this formula and um, how do we create context? Well, we create context pr primarily through manipulating imagery. What do our screens look like? Um, using sound and other media to create um, the, the ability to be immersed in a situation. Voice, I, I don't mean the nature of the speaking voice, but the way your content is written. Is it casual? Is it direct? Is it informal? Um, a lot of times I think we create an off-putting voice in the formality and that's context too. And it creates a barrier between the ability for the learners to really connect with what you're trying to say. Um, and the narrative arc, I mean, telling stories is a great way to create context around um, content, it creates meaning. And really that's what we want to convey is meaning rather than content. And then finally sequence is also another great way to help with storytelling, also to put things into a contextual perspective of uh, how you're gonna guide people's understanding as they work through um, these ideas, okay? What context is not, is just decorating things. And I think a lot of people think that I'm gonna make, I'm gonna fix that bad, boring training by putting pictures in. Um, and if those pictures or those images don't contribute to the story, they actually get in the way. Um, and I, I think some people approach designing their screen sort of like they're scrapbooking. That let's put a few more things on here to make it pretty and won't it help if I have a picture there? unless that picture really helps tell the story or establishes meaningful context that connects with the learner, it's almost better not to have it. Um, you know, I think sometimes people use context or what they think is context to mask or camouflage the fact that they know that the interactivity is sort of not really very useful. So this shouldn't be um, a distraction. It, it, it should, your context should actually focus the attention and make it clearer what your, your main outcomes are. You know, and it shouldn't be generic. And I think this, this comes into clash with our need to be able to create e-learning at a good clip, because um, that brings in templates and pre-built things. But the thing is, if you have a structure that is built in the abstract, you're sort of admitting that you don't really care about context because whatever it is, is sort of established to be in a way meaningless because you don't want it to conflict with anything. And in doing it, you're losing a huge part of your ability to communicate with your learners is by setting the stage, making them know how things relate to each other. And it shouldn't be extra. You just shouldn't add context because, oh, it's on our chart and I got to put some context in. It really should be the foundation of what everything rests on, how your activities come out, how the feedback is delivered. It actually should be the source of how it feels natural to have a challenge. Okay, so that's what it shouldn't be. Now, what should it be? Um, before I do that, I saw some chat messages. Is there anything I should address, Carrie, before I? Yes, there are. Okay. It, it, it kind of exploded just a few minutes ago. Um, so there was one question about how would you approach context when the course is aimed at a diverse group of customers in different job positions? Like, would you need to have a context for each type? Well, there's two ways to do it. Um, you could have a different track for each of those. It would be a very specific context. That can add a lot of labor. I think what, if the, if the actual skills are uniform, I think a really good strategy is just to have a variety of contexts, different challenges that um, still practice the same skills, but everybody will find one of those that's gonna seem real. Um, but that also is has the extra, um, benefit of it sort of helps your employees understand what everybody else in the company is going through as well. And so I think the two strategies are to create specific context that you track people through, or you have a variety of related contexts that everyone will see something in it for them. I think the one answer that is not correct is to say, well, I'm going to have to do something that is not specific for anyone for fear of offending them. Um, and then you lose a huge amount of communication ability. 
Um, and then there was one more question about just dealing with sensitive subjects and how you would approach those like with diversity and inclusion when it's not a physical product and it's a sensitive topic. Yeah, well, again, so much of this depends on details that um, may change the answer. But a lot of times when you have a very maybe disturbing or sensitive topic, those are times I would build maybe more of a whimsical, I mean, not, whimsical is not the right word, but a more artificial illustrated context where you have characters who are not real, um, but are taking the place of real people. So you're not disturbed by the fact that, oh, this child has a, a, has a disease that's going to kill them, you know, or whatever it might be. And it allows you to remove the immediacy of that and still to talk about some very serious things. It also, um, you know, I'm sure you all have grappled with diversity and how do you show a range of, of people without it being tokenism, you know, you wanna, you, we wanna have a diversity of racial background and of gender and all those things, but there's a limit of how many examples you can show. And ultimately, if you look at it, somebody's gonna say, well, you don't have this person in there. And so um, it's, I've found it's better to be a little bit more ambiguous about that, to actually even create hybrids of representation that clearly are representing everyone, even though they may not rep represent a very specific individual. And again, you can do that through more of an illustrative, illustrative style than by relying on photographs. Um, but it, you know, it's tough, it depends on the background of your audience and so forth and really what the content is. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so a couple of things, you know, why we want context, what is more than just putting, you know, when we say it creates a situation? Well, mainly it creates meaning. We gather meaning from our environment and learners often are learning about something that they're gonna apply in an environment that they may not be an expert in. And they may not even have the prior knowledge to know what do I relate this to? And so by creating that meaning through the context, you, you communicate very directly and people have that aha. Oh, I know why I can see um, why this is important and how it, it relates to what I do. And so one of the biggest goals when you're thinking about what am I gonna create in context is how can it be so um, specific in the meaning, um, in, in, in creating meaning. Another thing is you want context captures a learner's attention. Um, it may not be the first thing that you design, but it is the first thing that the learner encounters. And um, you really need, you know, you can't waste five screens with objectives and why we need to do this and what are the regulations. Because in those five screens, you have lost the learner. Um, in our, you know, our learners come with a few seconds of um, time to think, is this useful? And so you need to hit people right away. And one of the greatest ways to grab people's attention is to tell a story that can, includes things that people care about, characters, people that they may, maybe not exact people they know, but people they could recognize, people with names, problems that they might have seen or could well imagine. And if you get somebody in that story and then there's gonna be conflict, there's gonna be resolution, all the things that we know about that capture our attentions. And humans are sort of hardwired to listen and engage in storytelling. And that is a great way through context to create that um, attention. The other thing that context do is it focuses you. It inserts the learner into the action. And so you're no longer distracted by all the other things like, you know, how do I move these letters to match these items? It has nothing to do with anything. And yet it's amazing how irrelevant aspects of an interaction can um, divert the focus of the learner. And so if you establish a strong context and everything that is meaningful happens within that, that sort of has built a wall that I'm no longer gonna be worried about, well, what email did I just get? Um, what, what's going on, what I'm gonna have for lunch? All those things get, have become less important and are really distractions um, when someone is sitting there working alone, trying to engage. Um, you know, and they should inspire the context um, it should engage your emotions. It should bring to the fore 
what matters. And I think so often we get buried in what do you need to know or what are our rules when we forget that people can feel. <laughs> you know, we have hearts, we have souls, we have intention. And the context can draw that to you. You know, somebody mentioned you know, difficult topics. Well, drive right into the difficulty. That's what we feel. And when I feel empathy for someone going through a really difficult situation, and I'm challenged to think, well, how could we make that better? How could improve it? That's an amazing way to create contextual um, intensity. And then finally, it's, you know, it really is about learning. That to learn, you need to be, you need to own it. It needs to be active. And by creating a good context, it puts you into the action that you can actually um, do something. So, so what does this really look like? We have about five minutes here. I want to show just some quick uh, insights of what context can look like. Uh, Zoom needs to fix the way they let you <laughs> switch between sharing. Um, Here's a little bit of example, and it can be very simple. This was part of a training that was done for people just to identify um, electrical problems. It was a maintenance agency, you know, and it's just sort of arbitrary facts, but they, they created an abstract thing that you're looking through this viewfinder. And it's just a structure that makes it reasonable. Why am I looking at these examples that are sort of taken out of context? And I see them and I have a time limit before, and I have to decide, is this a hazard or not? And if I get it right, I get some feedback suggesting that. Um, and not that this is mind shattering or any, even that great, but it is better than not having context. It gives me a reason to think about these and to focus on different ideas. This is also followed later in this course by, you know, I talked about inserting someone into the action that now after I've had that sort of preliminary look into well, what are the sort of pro electrical problems you could find around a pool? Now I have, um, I'm going to fix some heating, but I'm supposed to look around and notice, are there other hazards here? So here I am right in the pool and I'm not restating what are the electrical hazards, but I'm supposed to look at a real environment and think, hmm, is there anything wrong? Well, these lights are hanging awfully low against this pool and if somebody would jump up, that would be a problem. So I'm gonna pick those. And then here's a closer look and I have to say, well, what's the problem? Well, I think the lights are too close to the water. So it's impossible to talk about context and interaction without getting into the challenge and the activity and so forth. But I mainly wanna focus on how interacting with this in a picture of a real life pool, um, it, it makes me realize what I would do as a person showing up at a site to do some maintenance work. Um, and it is, it is um, undeniably engrossing. Um, the last one, just to show you a very different type. This is um, this is some sales training, and because you know when you're doing this, you sort of need to um, include expectations, and they wanted to have content. And so here's sort of the non-context co content delivery, and you can explore this and find out what are the different personality types. I would say this is completely context free. Um, it's, it's a source of some information, but you're not going to learn much from that or be engrossed. What happens is now let's practice adapting to by, your buyer styles. It's Start by choosing a buyer by then challenges. act fast. You and have just 34 have to seconds to identify his or her style and, and indicate how a, you can adapt to communicate more and, effectively and with each style. A few seconds here to make a choice and I've got to do something. Well, here's the context. I'm actually applying these ideas of typing a person and I've got to figure out how to figure out what is this woman's style. I can shake hands with her and I get, she has a tentative handshake. I could ask a personal question and she doesn't really, really respond. And so I could continue there, my time's running. But when I think I've gathered enough information, I can say, I think she's a compliance controller. And then I have to say, what are you gonna do based on that knowledge? And so these choices, you could, you could imagine there'd be a very academic way to talk about what do you do with a compliance controller person, but having the context of, I'm in her office. I have, I've met her, I'm 20 seconds in and I've got to decide what am I gonna do? It's just transformative in terms of how that 
impacts learning. And it, it creates what I call irresistible e-learning. Um, you can't help but be focused, be inserted, be motivated, um, really grasp the purpose of this. And that's all made possible through con context. So um, let me bring us up to the, our final slides here. Are, well, as I'm doing that, are any other questions? I know we're right yes. up the end here. Um, there's lots of questions. There's a very active chat. Can you hear me okay, Ethan? I can. Um, so the question that was just asked, asked was, do you get any pushback for timed activities? It's, it's an accessibility concern where this person's at, so it's a big no-no. Yeah, um, well, in general, I'm not a big fan of timed things because um, it, especially early on, because it, uh, it doesn't take into account individual differences. But when you're trying to build automaticity so that somebody just knows something on the fly, it can be a really great tool. So I wouldn't generally start there, but in that example that we were looking at, you know, getting people to make snap decisions is important. Um, and so you maybe need to make allowances for uh, people with um, varied abilities or you wanna make sure that the mechanisms that you're having people respond with are not gonna be burdensome in terms of time. Um, so in general, unless you are really trying to up the pressure because somebody needs to be, um, to overlearn something actually is what we call that. Well, when you have something overlearned, there is no delay between when you um, are prompted to do something and when you're able to re generate that response. And, a lot of information over time we want to be overlearned. Um, and if you're training modules or trying to create that, you're gonna to have to do something like a timed response to, to add that pressure to build that auto automaticity. Okay. Do you think we're at the we're at the Anything we're at else? minutes? No, we could look at this question we could, I've done before I've answered questions and we can maybe send out um, some of yeah, those we can do some kind of follow-up and address ones that weren't, weren't, yeah. weren't answered. Yep. So, so that's inter instructional interactivity. Um, if you want to read more about that, uh, Michael Allen's Guide to E-Learning is just a fantastic source for this kind of thinking. Um, and at the heart of that is more information about context, challenge, activity, and feedback, our CCEIF model. And to that end, next, join me next week, and we're going to look at challenge, sort of in the same way, just digging in a little bit more. Um, to, to reveal what are the main issues there. Um, there are a lot of other resources you can follow up and we have a, a blog series of really great articles. There are more publications. I think that Claire will be posting links in the chat if you wanna uh, get contact with those. And then also um, we really encourage you if you're wanting to pursue this thinking and, and really develop these skills. You know, we have the Allen Academy and one of our main programs is the Allen um, Certified Instructional Professional, which really takes people who haven't had much experience to a point of really creating high level CCAF sort of interactions. The first course is Design 100, which just sort of gets your feet wet. And then we go through much more of an interactivity design class, an instructional design class. And then we have this, what's turned out to be just terrific, at least I'm enjoying it very much. And I think the learners are, are really doing well is a practicum where you have expert advice, you get several hours of consulting that we work individually on a project that you are building. So those are all available to you and you can find more on our website. So thank you. Um, I love talking with you about these. So and I welcome any kind of um, follow-up and I hope to see you next week. And uh, there we go. Thanks so much, Ethan. Thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your day. We'll be sure to follow up with um, details on next Wednesday's webinar. Have a great day. Yeah, bye.